My name is Elizabeth Scott. I'm an urban planner at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, and I'm really, really pleased to be here tonight to share with you all uh, a new tool that we've developed that at CMAP, it's an acronym for my planning organization, along with some partners. It's about housing and the nature of communities across the region, and uh, I hope that you'll find it really interesting. Um, so I work in our local planning division, which means primarily I spend my time giving, uh, giving direct assistance to communities across the region on planning questions. Um, communities are welcome to apply to my agency for technical assistance if there's anything that they'd like to do that they don't have in-house expertise to do. Typically CMAP provides that. Um, we also uh, give out federal transportation money. Uh, we direct the investments for that. That's the primary purpose of the agency. And then uh, we do policy work, which I also do. Uh, I focus on economic development and housing. But this is sort of a special tool. Uh, for a long time, there's been a partnership among several regional organizations called Homes for a Changing Region. The Homes partners are my agency, CMAP, uh, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, which is a coalition of sort of regional councils of government and a place for mayors and elected officials to share ideas with one another. And then finally, the Metropolitan Planning Council, which I bet has been here to talk to you all at some point. They're a nonprofit planning organization that promotes good government, sustainability, and equity across the region. So for a long, long time, these three agencies have been working together on uh, housing planning. And, uh, and so I'm here to talk to you about sort of the history of that, but also new work that we've done. Uh, so just to give you a sense of where we're going, I'm going to introduce the Regional Housing Solutions tool, which if you have the notes open, you can find a link to the URL, which is also easily regionalhousingsolutions.org. Um, I'm going to use a PowerPoint to discuss the analysis because nobody really likes to see somebody else like messing around with a website. But if you are looking at a screen, I'll just assume that you're so fascinated that you're looking at the tool while I'm talking and not because I, I've lost you. So, but yeah, feel free to check that out. There are also some other resources uh, in the notes for this session, like a link to the methodology for our study and some other things that you might find interesting and we can talk about. Uh, as we go on. So these are the partners. These partners together have a program called Homes for a Changing Region. And this group, since 2005, has made a lot of plans. What does that mean? We uh, are solicited by typically groups of clusters of suburban municipalities who would like some assistance thinking about what kind of housing stock they have and whether they have any needs as far as housing that the community should produce so that uh, local, local residents have housing that matches their demands. So examples for that would be things like, do we have enough affordable housing? Do we have enough accessible housing, either for people with disabilities or seniors? You know, is the, how is the community changing? Uh, and how can, we, how can the municipalities shape the built environment to serve the community? But these things take a really long time. Uh, our group is, uh, different sizes at different times, but it's like five to seven people. So if we work with three communities, it takes us 18 months to come up with a really intense plan. And so over a little bit more than 10 years, the Homes for a Changing Region Partnership has only made plans for 43 communities. Um, there's 284 communities in our region, uh, not counting the many, many, many unincorporated areas also in our region. So when we thought about evaluating our work and about how we could have a better impact, I thought maybe doing them one at a time is not the best approach. So the Homes for a Changing Region partnership started to create more region-wide tools that were usable and accessible by municipalities that were interested in housing issues so that they could uh, have res resources easier at hand than uh, doing a full planning engagement around housing issues or other, other types of issues. So we created a website called Homegrown that has case studies and best practice research for housing policy uh, focused on things that have been successful in the Chicago region. Uh, we have a bunch of toolkits about uh, analyzing housing data for local communities, doing outreach in local communities around housing issues, especially 
issues of community acceptance of affordable housing. Uh, and then finally, we have a data tool, which we update every year, which this may be of interest to this group. You can go to CMAP's website. If you Google Homes for a Changing Region CMAP, it will probably turn up to you the Homes uh, data tool, which is a macroed out Excel spreadsheet that you can put in the name of any municipality or Chicago community area in the region, and it'll spit back to you a ton of up-to-date uh, community information about housing and other information you might be curious about, like what is the median income in Mundelein? You know, uh, it take, takes a little bit of legwork to get there, but this tool can do it for you. So if you're interested. So these are the types of tools that we were making, and we we're having conversations with people throughout about were they useful, uh, were, was it uh, addressing a need, and it's been pretty successful, but as we continue to develop this type of thinking, we wanted to develop a region-wide analysis, something that would be applicable to all of the municipalities and unincorporated areas across the region, including the city of Chicago. And we wanted to find a way to think about what are shared challenges across the region, what's the right way to think about peer communities, because the old way of thinking about peers, and this is how our group used to think about it, is like, oh, if communities are next to each other, they're probably peers, right? Well, not really. The more we got to know places, the more we knew, you know, your, uh, what, it, what is the one, the town over in The Simpsons? Shelbyville, you know? Sometimes, Shelbyville's different sometimes. And, and so assuming that just because places are near each other doesn't mean that you're going to have uh, intelligent thought about who's peer, who are peers and where might practices be most effective. So we wanted to have something across the region that would be a more sophisticated way to identify peers and hopefully create some cohorts and opportunities for co-learning around these uh, peers that we identified. And, and to use this as a platform to share good ideas and, and best practices across the region. Kind of so um, anybody who cares about housing would be able to go on this website and get the first take at like what coming to my office and having a conversation for an hour would probably turn up. So we think the, in, the analysis is pretty interesting. Uh, we partnered with the DePaul Institute for Housing Studies to perform the actual clustering analysis. So I put out in a probably not very obvious place a, p a bunch of printouts about this. Let me actually just pass these. We can, we can pass. Will you help me with that? And half, half there, half there. So on this printout, and it's also, I believe, linked in the notes, you'll be able to see the variables that went into this analysis. It's about 45 variables. And the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul worked with the Department of Computer Science at DePaul to do something complicated that I, I honestly, I'm not really sure what exactly it is they did. But there was an algorithm, R was used, and an analysis was performed that squished all of these indicators into a clustering model that, uh, you know, and, and generally the indicators are measures of housing affordability, information about housing stuff like age or value, uh, <laughs> investment and market conditions, uh, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. And so this R thing that was done squished everything. Uh, into an analysis that produced eight clusters. And the, clus the clustering analysis was calibrated to maximize similarities and minimize differences among these eight buckets of kind of amalga amalgamated characteristics. So in this analysis, um, geographic location is not a factor. Uh, the proximity to the metoid value is a factor. So Basically, a bunch of numbers get analyzed, and then the values that are closer to one another are identified, rather than having anything to do with how close I am to Steven and Micah versus the people in the back of the room. Uh, so, so there's no, like, um, sometimes in this type of model, you would use a gravity measure, distance from the center, or something like that. There's no uh, elements like that in the analysis. We also uh, intentionally did not include poverty status or race and ethnicity, which we can discuss more about. And you can see the data sources there as well. 
They are at this point kind of old, but it took us a really long time to develop this approach. However, we're fairly confident that these indicators are the type that are pretty stable across time, but we are seeking funding to update, update the underlying data, and that's not gonna be a big deal. It, the biggest deal was just kind of figuring out how to do all of it. Um, but so, looking, looking at the, uh, the thing, you can see across the top, you have eight clusters, names of the clusters, and then along the uh, left side of the paper, you can see the different data variables. And so what the boxes show are the high and low value for each cluster, and it highlights things that are either low or high in the distribution of uh, indicators. So by looking at a cluster column and looking down for the ones that pop out because the boxes are colored, you can start to see which characteristics define which clusters. I, th I, I don't always give people the spreadsheet, but I thought this group would appreciate it. Um, but so, so phase one of this project was to do the clustering model. And then phase two, and this is I think a little bit unusual for this type of work, we went on to perform hundreds of interviews with experts. Uh, like for a year, I just interviewed people constantly, and there are a lot of people on my team doing this as well. We talked to elected officials, municipal staff, banks, uh, CDFIs, other kind of people who provide equity for development, uh, for-profit and non-profit developers, market analysts, all the consultants, pretty much all of the consultants, uh, community and neighborhood-based organizations, um, academic planners, really anybody that uh, we thought had a real good expertise on housing in the region we talked to, and I had a huge roll-up print out version of the map of our analysis that we would take around, put on the table, and then just have a conversation about how the cluster strikes people and what, what kind of ideas it motivates. And once we had that conversation, we talked about whether there are any specific policies that are most important in the different areas. So we did all this you know, numbers work to identify clusters, but then we had to have some qualitative work to try and figure out what, is, what does it mean, and what are the policy implications that we need to package with it? So, uh, so here's the result that we got. It's a, a, this is a map of our region. Uh, just to, for those of you who do not look at maps of the region all day, just to give you a sense, here's Lake Michigan. Obviously, city of Chicago with the Chicago community areas filled in. Cook County, uh, Lake, McHenry, Kane, DuPage, Kendall, Will. These are the counties of our metropolitan statistical area, and they're the counties that CMAP serves. So that is, that's how we chose the geographic extent. So, now I'm gonna describe the individual clusters, and I'll switch back and forth between these two maps because I find it interesting and helpful to look at them separated. So cluster one here, you see in the yellow, is our lowest value cluster, has the highest incidence of uh, foreclosure, highest rates of subsidized households. Uh, it's the most distressed cluster. So you see it, see it in context. It's primarily within the city of Chicago, south and west side of the city of Chicago and the south suburban Cook County. You see it in context there with the other clusters. Cluster two is a less distressed version of cluster one, similar challenges, but a little bit better um, current condition. Uh, you see cluster two primarily on the northwest and southwest sides of Chicago, and then interestingly enough, in the centers of the region's old uh, big cities. So we would call those typically in planning sub-regional job centers. So you see Joliet, Aurora, Elgin, and Waukegan there all popping out uh, as little, little hot spots, and those are the more challenged areas in the downtown of those communities. So you see it back in context there. Then we have cluster three, which is higher density, urban, young, high income. We've got the lakefront on the north side of Chicago, plus parts of Evanston and Oak Park. 
We uh, sometimes call cluster three son of cluster six, um, which I'll just jump to there. That's, uh, that's our kind of North Shore communities, Northwest Cook, parts of DuPage County. Similarly, it's a higher income, higher education, higher home value area. But uh, one of the challenges that these areas have is that they are aging. And young people are not necessarily moving uh, to, for instance, the North Shore in the same rates that they would have like 20 years ago. Because I think one of, you know, one of the trends that we see and that came out in this research is that young people, especially young people with means, are interested in being in a walkable, urbane, amenity-rich environment. That's a little bit different than uh, some, of, some of the places in Cluster 6. But these are the types of interesting kind of ideas that come out looking at the clustering model. So Cluster 3, Cluster 4, which this should be dark green, that is a mistake, um, is our kind of inner ring Oh, maybe it's the calibration on the screen. Yeah, we can just look here. These, these are our inner ring historic suburbs, like your, your Berwins, your Bensonvilles. Uh, some of them have metro stations, some of them don't, but it's more typically walkable, bungalow kind of, kind of places. They're uh, the traditional homes of moderate income people in our region. But uh, because these uh, communities are sort of closer to downtown Chicago, as people become more and more interested in working in downtown Chicago, we're starting to see prices go up in some of them as young families, for instance. Millennials form families and they would like a yard, but they'd also still like to be able to ride a train for 30 minutes and be in downtown Chicago. So that's uh, some development trends that, that we're watching associated with that cluster. Cluster five is a, also a natural pair for cluster four. Cluster five is older kind of inner ring suburbs. It's auto oriented, a lot of strip malls. Its biggest challenge is that uh, the form of cluster five was desirable in the 1970s and not very many people think it's that desirable now. They're not walkable. The houses um, are a li little bit run down. One consultant described it as old, but not in a cute way. Um, so these places need to think about uh, placemaking and how they can be thriving, desirable uh, locations for development going forward. They have lots of assets, but it's all about thinking about what are the characteristics, challenges, and opportunities of these different places as themselves and being realistic about what that is. So that's cluster five. And then we talked about cluster six. And then uh, cluster seven is the dark blue, is our newest housing. A lot of, uh, frankly, exurban greenfield development that has occurred over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, these are new, new subdivisions. You can typically get like a 2,600 square foot house in your two to $300,000 range in these communities, which is why many of them developed, because people want to live in big new houses that they can afford. Totally understandable. We also see a tiny registration of the middle of Chicago where all of these condos and apartments have been built. I'm sure we all notice the 60 cranes in the sky. So that, that also registers there. And then finally, cluster eight, which has uh, basically the 1980 through 2000 sort of lighter intensity development that makes up the rest of the region. So this is, this is what our clustering model showed us. And we put it on a website, because we thought that people might find that helpful. Uh, this website was developed you know, with the Homes for Changing Region partners uh, by Webitex, friend of Hack Night. No, nobody for Web? Yeah, yeah, so our friends at Webitex, do, they do great work and they're a joy to work with. We're really, really happy to be able to do this project with them. Uh, with the support of the Chicago Community Trust and the Harris Family Foundation. So it's good, it's good to thank your partners. But so here's this cool website that uh, encapsulates the analysis. Can somebody uh, yell out a community, one that's real? East Garfield. I 
it right. So if you type in any community in the region, it'll zoom you into uh, the sub-market uh, analysis for this. And you know, it overlays a map with landmarks so you can actually see what we're talking about. And if you go, you know, further click on East Garfield Park, it tells you a lot of information about the sub-markets that make up this community, including what proportion is in what cluster. What you know, so we have in East Garfield, 97% in submarket one, our highest distress submarket. That rings true, given current conditions. Although we know gentrification is a major concern in East Garfield Park, this is one way in which our data, being a few years old, is a disservice to the website. There are a few places where gentrification is heating up, where the website is not quite perfect. I would say. East Garfield and North Lawndale is one of them, uh, as is sort of Hermosa, Belmont, Cragen area. Um, but so, all right, what submarket is it in? Some information about that, a little pop-out map. It also has the ability to make a PDF and print it, not because we think that's a beautiful way to look at a website, but sometimes some people you talk to need a printout. And you can't tell them, like, oh, I'm sorry, you, it's a website, you have to look at it online because for whatever reason, sometimes that's what's needed. So it does that. Um, also, there's a link to, uh, oh, here's a link to our Excel spreadsheet I was talking to you about. I didn't know that was on there. Um, but also a link to more census data about every community that the tool serves. And then as you go on, you'll see the policy part that came out of all the interviews we did. So basically, this part of the website Goes in, has a discussion of what are the key policy issues related to these submarkets that are probably of a concern in this place. So you can read about the issue. So, so for instance, here in submarket one, we know that code issues are a problem. Uh, buildings are often in poor repair, but municipalities, including the city of Chicago, have to strike a balance between enforcing the rules so that people's health and safety is protected, but not enforcing the rules in a punitive way so that people who own buildings that are in poor condition but can't afford to fix them are not unfairly disadvantaged. You know, it's the municipality's role to encourage redevelopment and protect the public safety, not, you know, run poor people out of their homes. So there's some discussion of uh, that balance for code enforcement and different ideas for things that you can do to help address that. So you can read the website and find out about all of these kind of policy things, uh, your, your own self, it, but now that you know that it's here and there's discussion, discussion of issues, uh, I, hope, I hope that you'll do that um, and rather than, than going, into it, going into it a ton here. Yeah, we can have a question now. So this is within the city of Chicago, but let's say it's in Mundelein. Is the intent of this for the city of Mundelein, the village of Mundelein, to look at this and say these are policy decisions we should make? Uh, that they use it as guidance, yeah. And we've had events with municipal staff. We have taken this tool to the regional councils of government. We sent them postcards trying to get anyone who might benefit from the uh, policy supports that are in this tool to look at it and think about it. And maybe not every idea will be appropriate in every single cluster because one of the interesting things about this clustering model is that often it's the interaction between clusters inside a community that uh, produces the most interesting or usable results. But yeah, it is, it, is, it is our intention that elected officials, elected and appointed officials would look at this and use it as a guide for policy. And all the communities in the region are included. It's not just the uh, city of Chicago. So you can type a zip code, you can type a place, you can type your address, anything. Any more questions about the website? Micah? Um, is it 3% of the population? Oh. Is it 3% of the population or 3% of the land? Land area. We thought about weighting it by population, but that would uh, skew some places in ways that we thought were not desirable. Um, but so, I'm um, just wrapping up here. Here's this tool that we made, and we hope that you all check it out and find it interesting. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we're using it with the Homes for Changing Region partners, CMAP, the Mayor's Caucus, and MPC. 
We have taken this tool, and so to your point about what do we expect Mundelein to do with this, we've been taking it to communities that we thought might benefit from the policy recommendations in the tool and working with them to walk through the recommendations in the tool and see, see if it can be helpful to them. So in the top picture, we have a bunch of people talking to stakeholders in North Lawndale. The blonde woman there <laughs> who has kind of a bad face in this picture, sorry, Amy if she sees this, is, is talking about how Berwyn uh, began to market itself because North Lawndale is interested in the idea of starting to tell their own story. Because a lot of people, when they hear North Lawndale, they don't necessarily think of all the positive things that that community has, like amazing architecture, access to every highway, transit access, so on and so on. And so they're talking, talking about affirmative marketing, which is one of the things the tool recommends for cluster one and two communities. So we created information exchange there. And here on the bottom, this is the mayor of Stager, which is on the Cook County, Will County border. And this is the mayor of uh, Round Lake, that is in Lake County. They're like 70 miles apart, but they're both in cluster five. We helped them create an information exchange to talk about rental regulation, which is one of the policies recommended for cluster five. Uh, we believe that Stager will start a new program, hopefully this year. And then finally, um, we're using these submarkets in a lot of other ways too. And this is why I said more later on our choice to not include race and ethnicity and poverty status in the analysis. It's because CMAP and uh, MPC both have extremely robust areas totally focused on um, equity, racial equity, economic justice, these types of issues. And so we are using the housing submarkets to overlay with other things that we're already doing. Uh, we also have a Brookings Community of Practice, which is uh, the Brookings Institution, if you all have heard of that, likes to highlight and raise up good things happening across the country as examples for what other regions can do. They think that maybe other regions might benefit from doing a similar effort, which we found very flattering. And then we uh, plan to work with more communities to actualize the recommendations in the tool in 2018. And so then also it says on to 2050, which I would be remiss if I did not mention that at CMAP, we're working on the region's next uh, regional comprehensive plan, which basically will be a big document that will plan for all, all the things, all the things in the region, including housing issues, issues of economic opportunity and equity, uh, among many, many other things like transportation access, uh, issues of environmental quality, basically all the things that planners like if you have an idea of what that universe of things is. Uh, but this will be a big piece of that too. And so here's an example of uh, the white outlines, basically racially concentrated areas of poverty. And so we're overlaying, starting to overlay these different analyses with one another to see if they can mutually inform one another. So we find, for instance, that in the region, uh, racially concentrated areas of poverty, we have our own way of talking about it. We describe them as economically disconnected areas, but we can discuss that later if there's interest. Uh, but you see, see that places that have a lot of minorities and poor people are not necessarily all submarket one or two, you know, like you might have predicted. So a lot of people in submarket five and even some people in submarket four and other markets across the region. So that helps us think about what are the right policy levers to, to start to address these kinds of issues? And so that's why we think about them separately, so then we have the opportunity to pile them all up. We also look, use this to look at uh, major, major areas with major issues of, with urban flooding, for instance. Those are just some examples. And all of this will come together in, uh, onto 2050, which will be adopted in October of this year. So, uh, you know, you can be on our mailing list if you want to know more about that. And then I thought I would just close with whether there's any civic tech ideas for things you might be able to do with this. So I put um, in the notes for this presentation a link to a spreadsheet that has all the census tracts in the region and then all the clusters that they're assigned. So if you want to play with it, I wish you would. Um, I kind of thought about this for a few minutes before coming over here, like what would happen if you like within the city of Chicago, compared graffiti requests or uh, the dis you know putting out of garbage carts, like when you need another one, you have to order one, uh, or 
rat abatement with the submarkets? What about you know, all the things that Loveland Technologies and others do where you have like a phone that helps do a survey of building condition? I don't know. I also thought it might be interesting if you're trying to look at something across the region as a way to test a hypothesis. If you've created something and you don't know if it makes sense, you could say, well, I know like this submarket has these characteristics. Does this thing I made showing hotspot here make sense in context of that? Like if you don't have personal intuition about the nature of the different communities. Those were some ideas that I had. But anyway, I'd like to uh, leave time. Do you have time for questions? If you all have any questions. So I just wanted to see if you had any um, success examples, for instance, in the south suburbs. I know you talked about a couple, but what are some other places who, you know, you guys suggested uh, these are the things you should do, and then they did the things, and then it was great. We're, uh, we're trying to get to there now. Um, yeah, our best example in the south suburbs is with Stagger. Uh, we think that they're going to adopt a rental regulation approach based on what the re website recommends and working with them. But honestly, we're at the phase now where we're just trying to talk to people and put the tool in front of them and help them understand how to use it. But uh, our group is also going to be focused on uh, trying, to help, trying to help along the coalition of the willing, I'll call it. You know, if somebody says, hey, we love your website, we'd like to implement some of the recommendations, uh, we will help you. So if any of you are municipalities, you can let me know that. <laughs> Can you run this model per year so you can see like the changes over years, like the changes either from policy impacts or from just trends that are happening? Yeah, that's the, the plan uh, fen uh, pending funding. Like uh, all good things. Hi. You, you mentioned that this tool, your, your primary goal is to get mun municipalities to implement some of the ideas. As someone who's just a lay person, do you have any... Um, like thoughts about how we could use it, or is it more of a tool for us to kind of bring it to our municipalities and have them make changes? That's a really, really great question. Um, I think this is a tool for anyone who cares about their neighborhood and wants to learn more about it. I think just understanding what are the submarkets and what submarket is your community either all or part of, or, or what is the combination of them, can start to give you information about you know, uh, da data about the characteristics of your community. So let's say wherever you live, you want to get together with some neighbors and talk about the challenges that are facing your community. It's one tool to say, hey, um, we, know, we know what we're facing, but this thing says we're in submarket two. You know, that means that these policy people think that these are the five things that we're really majorly facing, and here are some ways to get started working on it. Not a lot of them are going to be things that you personally, as a concerned citizen, can implement. But particularly in the city of Chicago, um, you know, aldermen have ward nights. You can go see them and bring them any type of idea that you want to share with them. And if you have neighbors that come with you, they're, you know, I'll just say, even better. Would you recommend implementing a CBA, Community Benefits Agreement, in any of the types of communities you identified? Yeah, that's one of the strategies that particularly recommended in, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, submarket two and three. Uh, the idea there would be you would want, you community benefits agreements are especially useful in places facing gentrification pressures, although I would say there are some limited examples too where it might be useful in a submarket one, but particularly if Let's say there is interest in the private sector to do some something, whether it's build a building or create a factory or something. They want to do it. And they want to do it in that place badly enough that they'll be willing to uh, work with the community to make sure that it happens. So those strategies are not effective when, the, when place is fungible, when the developer says, like, fine, I don't care. I'll just drive further out the highway. It doesn't make a difference to me. But when place matters, that's a good place for a uh, community to get, get involved and ask, you know, through their elected officials and organizing power to ask that certain things be done uh, if, if, uh, if the private sector wants, wants something, including building a thing in a particular place. Hi. 
Um, I was just wondering if you there was like one or two bullet points or major points that you could to share from all the interviews you did and like any insights from the qualitative data and how that influenced either the site or the policy recommendations or anything? Um, I think the role of transit availability in future development outlook was ma a major, major theme that we heard throughout our interviews. Uh, whether we're talking about the city of Chicago or talking about suburban municipalities served by Metra, uh, experts continually emphasize the role, particularly of like, fixed rail transit. So that means you have like a train station where the infrastructure is embedded and can't go away uh, on uh, fut future values and development opportunities. That, that's one for sure. Like we had uh, some market experts who believe that every train station area within a 40 minute ride of downtown Chicago will be highly developed in the next 20 to 30 years. Do we believe that? I don't know, that's someone's opinion, but it's, it's something we heard. Uh, also heard more about uh, consumer preference for uh, walkable places with amenities as people's, people's lives are, have, have changed. All right, Q2. Did you find any unexpected results in the data? Well, I didn't perform the primary analysis, so um, I normally would have something for you, but not, a, not on this. What, I, I guess I'll say one interesting thing was that um, if you include race and ethnicity in the clustering model, the whole uh, south side of Chicago and south suburban Cook County become one blob. They just become their own cluster, which was kind of contrary to the result that we wanted to see because we know that there are differences between places in the south side of Chicago and the south suburbs, and we didn't want those uh, differences to be, to be overpowered by the influence of race and ethnicity in the model. Okay, awesome. Everyone give Elizabeth a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.